Um, so on the, the topic of public-private partnerships, um, a theme that's been running through my head, just given the political climate, is the I will do it alone versus we the people can make this happen. And I think that's a really interesting dichotomy to think about for public-private partnerships. When we go and we advise people, we say, you need a leader, you need a visionary, you need someone who is going to be your champion for this project because they are complicated, they are difficult, and they take a long time. Um, but on the flip side, you need everyone to be involved to make it happen. And I think the cultural district is, is an example where it feels like it was somewhere in the middle. Um, it maybe was a little messy because it was so much of the we and there's different heads and people changing. And I think looking back on that experience, you know, where could have been, where were the benefits for that messiness and where were the, the difficulties and has it enabled the ultimate goals of trying to knit back into the neighborhood and bringing the neighborhood in um, and also improving the neighborhood, has that really happened and how do you kind of, like looking back, seeing what could be done differently? Yeah, so it's a big one, but. Um, I think actually Fort Green, um, I lived there for a while and I think from the residents of the Fort, uh, people who actually live in Fort Greene and Clinton Hill in that area, um, I don't necessarily know that they feel that all this new development that's going on in downtown Brooklyn and in, around the BEM Cultural District is really beneficial to them uh, in terms of being a, a recipient. I think there is a tremendous uh, backlash from the community saying that they can no longer afford to live there. And I think I think the city um, under the Bloomberg administration actually did a good job of downzoning the historic districts and creating those areas to protect uh, protect those historic brownstones and those beautiful areas. But you know, I think Brooklyn's at a point where there's tremendous change going on and there's a lot of growing pains. And the challenge for, I think, next 10 years is there's so much residential coming online. I think in next two to three years, there's almost 15,000 new units that's going to get built and delivered. That's combination of market rate condominiums, market rate rentals, and uh, affordable housing. And it's really important um, you know, for Pacific Park um, we did this as part of negotiation with the city and the state by providing 35% affordable as an overall development was one of the ways that we were able to actually um, create the large scale development for this project. And the affordability is actually very uh, uh, much more robust and it was, the city had never actually done a significant number of the middle income housing, which is really from 100 to 200% uh, of the AMI. And to give you guys an idea of what that means is 100% for a family of four in 2016 is about $88,000 a year, right? So we're talking probably teachers, right? Uh, recently graduating architects, most likely. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, you're, you're creating these, um, uh, much more sustainable development where all those people are living together, right? People who are paying, let's say, um, $3,000 for a studio are living in the same building where someone, because they income qualify, can pay $1,000 for a studio in a brand new, safe, doorman building with washer and dryer in your unit, you know, with amenities. And there's another person who's actually only paying $400 a month in studio, in income qualifies. And I think it's a little bit of a social experiment because it's not something this, that city has done very well, I would say, because they typically do 80-20s, where 20%, you know, until recently, you could even put people in a poor door, which is, you know, ridiculous. Um, so I think uh, part of, um, part of the, um, backlash against people being priced out, having to move away from their community. Um, we want to, at least for Pacific Park, we're going to reincorporate that community. So we've done lots of town hall meetings uh, at different uh, community boards, different schools, outreaches, just to make sure that, you know, to educate people who really would know what a lottery process is to get into a, affordable housing, to educate them and have them actually come and apply for these. Because it's really important. Like, I met a family, like, a guy is a freelancer, and I think his wife is a teacher, and they just had a child, and they're applying for this uh, affordable housing. Because 
alternative is like they're going to have to move out to Long Island somewhere else and they have to leave the city. And if they actually get this lottery, it would be like a life-changing event for them so they could stay within their community, be able to have children, raise their children in the community that they've invested in. I, mean, I think if you, you know, these are all the cultural district is, I think, a pretty amazing mechanism for the other side of the equation too, not only the affordable housing, but actually, you know, you look at uh, kind of institutions like BOM, right? Who have been able to get affordable office space and look at how many people that they employ and equally with Mark Morris and the number of, you know, these um, institutions use their facilities, especially like when you think about brick, right, or even glass, they use their facilities not just in the evening for performances, but there is a huge amount of programming for that was already there, but that just didn't have the facilities, wasn't well located. Ultimately, I think the equation in the city, and this is a bias because I'm not an affordable housing person, is that the more jobs there are that pay well, the more skills people have, the more education, money gets put into education, and there's a lot of universities in downtown Brooklyn, the, the easier it is for people to access those. Ultimately, the volume of affordable housing will start to, you know, like, it, hopefully it will continue at 35%, but it will mean something different if people have a way to pay even that AMI for their rent because they had an opportunity, you know, and this is really true across the board. Downtown Brooklyn was a place with a lot of a certain kind of jobs, essentially, you know, fire. And those jobs were highly, you know, prone to kind of political decision making. Should government move into these offices? But none of those jobs helped support arts. They, none of them really paid into supporting public spaces. So potentially, as long as it doesn't get balanced one way or the other, like too much Class A office or too much Class A housing, that Brooklyn continues to have enough volume, I think there's a very interesting experiment happening. Yeah, that's sort of my perspective. Right, I, I, I agree with yeah, what you said. And, but also, I feel like it's really important, you know, what we see all the time is like, there's so much growth happening in Brooklyn right now. And I mean, all over the city, but particularly Brooklyn. And the truth is that we haven't really come to terms with what that really means. And the truth is also that people who've been living in Brooklyn, are, nobody is in favor of growth happening around them. It's just the way yeah, things yeah, are. Yeah. Nobody wants it anywhere near them, no matter how beautiful it is, no matter how much affordable housing there is, no matter how much wonderful sidewalk art there is. They just don't want it, period. Even Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is an amazing thing, and I actually have spent a few years living across the street from it and completely enjoyed it. But I had neighbors who were utterly appalled that the park had even been built. They would have preferred to have abandoned piers there because just having these people come in and be around their space just freaked them out too much. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, so it's, it's, it's a really, it's so growing is an incredibly painful thing and it's always been that way. And so we have to try to figure out the best way to deal with it is ultimately, it is better for everyone. The city has to keep growing to survive and to remain viable. It's just not a choice. You can't say, well, we're just not going to build anymore because no one really wants it. It has to happen. We have to do it in the best way we can. We are living in a pretty enlightened area of development compared to what happened for the decades previously. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing the difference compared to what happened in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And so it's, you know, we should be thankful for that, but we still are trying to figure out a way to make development palatable for people who live in neighborhoods where they, they don't want it to happen. I appreciate very much the optimism of this table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's great. And New York is a fantastic force, and et cetera, et cetera. The truth is, is, is that all of this has a very good side and a very dangerous side. You know, and it's both with the high line, and it's happening in Brooklyn. And uh, obviously, you know, we all heard the high line is beautiful. There's no doubt about it. You know, Liz and Ricardo, and Ricardo Scofidio did a great job. Uh, James Corner did a great job. You know, what's happening in Brooklyn 
is amazing. But on the, but on the other side, uh, it, it is becoming a little bit of a zoo and a little bit of Disneyland, the whole thing. And it does bring higher taxes and it raises the value of the city. And, but, but then many, many people just cannot live there anymore. And uh, you know, I'm not a, an anti-gentrification advocate. I'm the contrary. You know, I believe very much in development. I believe very much in investment. But there must be other ways of dealing with this. I don't know what it is. I was yesterday. I was yesterday in the building I just showed you, and I can tell you that a one-bedroom apartment is renting for six thousand dollars. But that's not the worst thing. The worst thing that I heard is that in order to rent an apartment. Anybody needs to demonstrate that their salary is 50 times that amount. So anybody that doesn't make $300,000 a year cannot live in that building. So we're bringing all of these cultural institutions to, to an area that at the same time we're pushing away most of the people that would be the real natural and authentic uh, 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 people that would use these cultural institutions. We're bringing in really edgy cultural ins uh, institutions that used to be in, in sort of lost places, but who's going to be their audience now? You know, it's going to be people that perhaps their interests are others. Yeah. So, so there's a, a, a com very, very complex sort of balance that I don't think anybody, you know, all of us included, have been able to reach. Um, in, in a way, though, I think, just to counter that a bit, is that that site you were on, the loss was, I mean, wasn't it a, a big plant nursery, right? So if you, but there are plenty of sites in the city where the loss is a valued Odana library, the loss is uh, a uh, nursing home. Uh, everyone knows what site I'm referring to. The loss is that it changes what the brownstones cost. But there are, there's so much in the city that is dilapidated, ill-used industrial space that isn't supporting any jobs. And there's tons of city sites. And you know, I'm going to get back to the Brooklyn Strand. We're talking about berms on the sides of highways that for me, the city has to focus on not disruption of neighborhoods, but looking at the kind of growth in city-owned sites like it did on BAM Cultural District. It took city-owned sites that were essentially parking lots and or rail yards, except for a couple of sites. But, um, but like you're looking at sites that there's no eminent domain except for some police cars. You know, like the city has such capacity. New York, that's a great thing, I think, is that we have a lot of capacity. But we just want to, developers, and for you developers in the audience, you just want a sure thing. You just want to build in the same place everyone else is building after someone really who's done the hard work risking it, like you know everyone who tried to save that high line, and I'll count myself among them. But, you know, and basically people want the easy payoff. So the real issue is how do we encourage in our public policy entrepreneurial developers, the Jed Walentises who started off in Dumbo by, you know, giving uh, Jacques Torres cheap space. Like, how do you encourage that instead of the let's just swoop in and take it for the short-term gain? There has to be some sort of public penalty in not taking a risk so that we get something back, I think. I think it's easier to offer yeah. very low rents to companies like Jacques Therese when you bought the entire portfolio yes. <laughs> for significant, like way, yeah. Yeah. way yeah. below yeah. market yeah. and held up for 30 years. So yeah. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I think what is for your future developers out there, um, you know, there is a saying, uh, what is it? Pioneers get the uh, arrows and settlers yes. get yeah. the land. I think you know, developing in New York is incredibly difficult. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing a 20 unit building or 200 unit building, it's exactly the same. So it depends which wall you want to bash your head against. And you know, I, I don't want to sound negative, but it's the most fun, impactful thing that you can do with your life. I'm, you know, I, I personally love it. Uh, but there are battle scars that you will bear because the agencies you have to deal with, the negotiations that you have to uh, 
you know, have with the city and the state and the community because I think actually what's great is that the city, uh, the community organizations, right, uh, community boards have now become very savvy and they're very active vocal voices in the future of their community. So they are also st stakeholders. So you have to be able to manage all of these things so that, and there's a gift, there's always a gift. If it doesn't hurt, someone walked away scot-free, right? Both sides have to hurt, all sides have to hurt a little bit. But you come with a development that's appropriate for that site and you can look for pioneering mm -hmm. sites, you know, Bushwick's already over, right? So you have to go further down the L train, I think. <laughs> There's no other opportunities. But, you know, New York City, I think, is, is full of those things, but you have to have the um, um, staying strength in order to really develop it and see the project through it. Because it's going to take, literally, on a perfect project, it'll take you five years from the beginning to the end to bring a project online. The reality of it, it'll be a decade. But I think my argument was that the neighborhoods, not further down the L line, that shouldn't be the sole focus of developers. It's the infrastructure. Like, there are big sites that aren't, were never housing or haven't mm -hmm. been since they got taken over by Robert Moses. And those sites are scars in neighborhoods. And they're even not even neighborhoods. You look at Sunnyside Yards. If we all like said, guys, no one's going to oppose Sunnyside Yards and doing something. Mm -hmm. Let's all support and do make sure there's something interesting there. Th then no one is going to say that you've just destroyed my street of brownstones. No, but I, I think uh, what needs to be thought about is New York is an ecosystem. We are a very complex ecosystem. And whenever you develop something, you need to think about who are you benefiting and who's benefiting from you? And think about both sides of that. So with BAM, you know, we brought in a lot more attendance to BAM, who then fed the restaurants and the whole cultural, you know, amenities in the neighborhood, who then fed the res residential development, who then fed back the cultural assets, time. right? Very long time, but it helped the ecosystem develop and, mm -hmm. and foster upon itself. And so I think when you're looking at a project, you can't just look at that one site that's going to give you X amount of return. You have to think about it in the context and think about the ecosystem, both the jobs that it's creating and then who, where those people are going to live and how that's going to work together. Can I ask one question? Yeah. So I wanted to ask whoever wants to answer this. So why don't we, why isn't this happening again the city? Like, why isn't this happening in Harlem? Why don't we have a Harlem cultural district that where groups are getting this kind of new facility support? It's, uh, it's happening. But I think it goes back to having... Well, not in, the not in the mechanism we're talking no. about no, no, here. No, but, but similar. But I think it's happened, it goes back to a very strong visionary, right? Harvey was very forthful to create this in the beginning. Yes, there were lots of people involved, but you had this very strong leader in the beginning. And I think it's that balance between the leader and the we and how you bring them together. It's not because we don't have enough city-owned sites? No, I mean, because it, it wasn't just about the city-owned sites that made BAM happen. I mean, well, that's a large part it's of a large, it's part, large part, part of it. It's not an RFP a private site. No, but, but there weren't, I mean, it wasn't, it's not like the city just was like, here's our land, make it happen. Oh, there was okay, so my question happen. is, if I look at city-owned sites, for example, in Harlem, why aren't those RFPs requiring culture? Requiring okay, what? Why aren't the RFPs in Harlem on the city-owned sites requiring cultural investment the way they did at the Brooklyn Cultural District if there is a cultural district happening, which was part of the zoning on 125th and is not happening? I think you're right. I think there is lack of a single visionary, and also I would say um, stewardship from the city that that is lacking to make that happen. I think you know that leadership is incredibly important to make it happen. I also think that that leadership is not necessarily a responsibility of the city of the public realm, mm -hmm. and we need developers that are more uh, committed to social causes, to cultural causes, mm -hmm. and that are more visionary. Okay. In, in the project I was mentioning in Harlem, unfortunately it's a project I was partially doing with you. I'm not doing it with you anymore, but it's moving forward beautifully. And, and, it's, become, and it's becoming a, a cultural district, like cultural, and it's a totally 
a privately owned project that is attracting a number of cultural institutions and social institutions that will create in that part of Harlem, I believe, a, a similar situation. You know, they're not two situations are, are identical, mm -hmm. but it's pretty close, I would say. Yeah. Great, well thank you. This was, I think, really fascinating for us and hopefully for you all. Do you want to question or you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you want to, I know we're, we're late on time. We're so. running a little late, but just a couple of questions. Burning questions from the floor? Yeah. I was just wondering, we've all kind of echoed different parts. Um, best practices in New York versus other cities you've worked in, mm -hmm. things you've seen here that you love that aren't elsewhere, and vice versa. You know, that's a... That, that's a, 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 a that's such a huge theme, you know, that, that should be another yeah. seminar, yeah, another you know, obviously New York is a big example for the world, you know, it's a very sophisticated society, also it has tremendous problems, in, 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 I would be very happy to be part of such a thing, but it's really very long, you know, it's a very, very, very long discussion. And there, Well, uh, to be very brief, you know, obviously New York is a very sophisticated society where some issues are sort of not working very rightly. One of, it, one of them is a very beautiful idea and a very, like a great idea of the 20th century that I think has some tune-up, which is called democracy. And we're seeing it not only within our pro projects, you know, I hope you don't have to suffer it in your, in your bigger political realm, because th that could be a huge historical mistake due to a malfunctioning of democracy, for example. So the excess of democracy, you know, it's somehow creating huge problems in the city. It's also the, the huge excess of being a free market is creating huge problems. And free market is a beautiful idea. We don't have any, in any of the two cases, we don't have a better solution. You know, it's really the best solutions, but it's come to such extremes that it's backlashing. So, but, but those are very extreme themes, right. you know, that we should discuss. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, there, there you are. What a better way to uh, finish up with setting the stage for our next panel. And uh, we've heard that you know, the, this is the free market and democracy coming together both challenged, but both also having exciting outcomes. And I think Enrique's call for, a, for developers to be much more in tune with these, uh, these requirements for the public space and the public good of communities is precisely why we're having this today. This is uh, being hosted by the program, the, grass, uh, the Graduate uh, Masters of Real Estate Development Program. So hopefully our, many of our young people in the audience who are coming through will be such developers. So, Good luck. Yeah. So <laughs> on that note, I want to thank our panelists, uh, both of them, and invite everyone to have lunch, please. Mm -hmm.